Huh? I think it's okay. I think it's alright. Well, I would say, for the sake of those who came on time, to try to start on time, because uh, every good thing that has a beginning has to an end. And uh, I know that many of you came straight from work and had a long week and a long day. Um, then, I would um, I invite you to come closer. I mean, nobody, it's like in the school, everybody wants to sit back. At least uh, that was my custom. When I was in school, I always sit in the back, never, uh, with one exception. I chose to be in the front. Well, uh, once again, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, weekend basically on uh, the focus is on media and how media influences us as Christians, human beings, families, and uh, I hope it's going to be a, an instructive time that we can spend together and a blessing for most of us. It's going to be very practical and it is expected in a way that it will help us to make some practical applications in the end to. to uh, to change something. Lots of theological topics, they remain in the theological sphere, and it seems that they do not have an application to practical life. But this topic and this uh, weekend will have, I would assume that you'll hear lots of uh, things that will be very applicable. Again, well, welcome everybody. I see Amanda, welcome Amanda, good seeing you. Uh, before we begin, let us, uh, let us bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us to go through another week, keeping us safely, at least those who have come here tonight, after a long week, and as we uh, begin the Sabbath, and as we begin to uh, study and think, we invite you to be with us, and bless us tonight with understanding and, uh, and knowledge from you. We thank you for your assistance to the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The title of the battle for your mind, media, and spiritual life is the first of them. I'd like to begin with a passage from Revelation. It's, uh, it's a known passage for most of you. It's Revelation chapter 12. Now, uh, you can read it from the screen. I will read it from the Bible just to have people know that actually it comes from the Bible. <coughs> Revelation 12, 7 to 9. It says, <coughs> And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the dragon, the great dragon, was cast out that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Um, 
many of you have seen the passage multiple, multiple times. The first observation is that I believe that probably most of us forget that we are actually in a war zone. We enjoy the peaceful times, if we have plenty of food, comfortable jobs, or whatever we, we have in this life, it makes us feel that it's fine, it's okay, we can stay here long and it's a peaceful, it's a peaceful time. No, it's not a peaceful time. Uh, again, I, th I believe that most of us, or many of us, tend to forget that actually we live in a war zone. And the war is, the, this war is going on for a long time. Now, as you know, with every war, the closest the war comes to the end, the worse it gets, right? The, the closer you come to the end of the battle, the worse it gets. Because both parties are tired of fighting and they try to do anything possible to overcome the other one and end it. And as we know, the devil, as the Bible says, he's doing everything possible to win as many as he can with him because he knows that his time is short. Um, the Bible makes an interesting observation also, deceives the whole world. Is that including uh, me and you? Yes. Yeah. Then there is no question that the devil wants to deceive you and me or me and you. The statement is very general, but it says one thing. In my opinion, it says that actually the large majority of people are deceived. I believe that's what the statement says. The large majority of people have fallen onto the devil deception. Um, <clears throat> another observation made by the passage is that along with the devil, the devil is not alone. Who else is with him? How do we call them? How do we call them? You know, when you call them the evil angels, it doesn't sound so bad. When you call them the demons, it sounds really bad, at least to me, at least in my imagination. The demons are intelligent, powerful, and 100% evil creatures. They have nothing good in them. They have no mercy, they have no grace, they have no kindness, and they have only one purpose, to destroy. We forget that. It's, 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 um, I believe it's, it's important to remember this because I think most of the time, busy with our little lives, going here and there, doing this and that, we simply forget that we are in this very, very deep battle. Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 10 to 13 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the vials of the devil. The vials is the word in Greek, it's the word methodia. We have the word today, methods, and make the connection to be able to stand against the devil's methods. <clears throat> For we do not wrestle against the flesh and the blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of the wickedness in the heavenly places. It's interesting because the Bible says, the Apostle Paul says, principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness. I have a question. Are the demons organized? Yes. Yes. They must be organized. They are intelligent. They don't work just randomly and at chance. They must be organized. They must have methods. They have must strategies. To destroy. We forget that. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, um, when there's a battle, uh, I always thought of, I was in the military service, and, but I've never been in a real combat. But uh, you know that when you go to battle, one thing is sure. Not everybody comes back, right? That's right. When the battle begins, you have the whole thing, everybody marching, singing, la 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 la. When the battle is over, not everybody comes back. Not everybody's going to stand. Not everybody's going to be able to be stand. And the apostle, the apostle Paul repeatedly, repeatedly said, says that you should be able to stand. Some of us are going, are going to fall. And that's going to happen because the devil is very skilled in this battle, in this spiritual battle. He's very skilled. Some of us 
some of the people will be taken down by him. This is just an introduction to the topic because I think it's important to remind ourselves that we live in a spiritual, we live in a material world, but a battle is actually spiritual. <clears throat> Ellen White says in the book Messages to Young People, as we near the close of time, the human mind, what? The human mind, the human mind is more readily affected by Satan's devices. By what? Satan's devices. Satan's devices, strategies and methods. Satan has ever been ambitious to counterfeit the work of Christ and establish his own power and claims. He does not generally does do this openly and boldly. He is artful and knows that, he most, that the most effective way for him to accomplish his work is to come to poor fallen men in the form of an angel of light. And again, the passage is very profound, very deep, speaks about Satan, he is dealing with human mind, he devises his strategies and plans that he can overcome people on the battleground, and the battleground is human mind. Now, <clears throat> a few strategies, I think, that used by the devil in fighting this battle with human beings and deceiving the whole world and taking many of them down is basically what we, also, what we call the entertainment industry. Music, movies, social media, shows, sports, computer games, pornography, and gambling. And in all of them, he uses media. Media has become very successful in using all of this. Now, media has the power. <clears throat> A few statistics. For the radio to reach 50 million users, millions, it took 38 years. For the television, 13 years. For the internet, four years. For the iPod, three years. Facebook added one million users in less than nine months iPhone applications hit one billion in nine months. What is this telling you? What is it telling you is that actually it, the, the media moves very fast and, and it expands um, amazingly fast. The, 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 the media tools and devices and methods are, are moving very fast. That's, uh, that's, that's all I can say. Do you know who the guy is? How many of you know him? How many of you know him? That's the three of you. Well, <clears throat> I was one day in the doctor's office about a year ago or two years ago, and I found this Time magazine with the 100 most influential people in the world. The 100 most influential people in the world. Who's on the cover? It, it, it's Mr. Jay-Z. And he's a scientist. He has developed a new method of uh, curing, uh, of, of, of healing breast cancer in two months. Have you heard that? <laughs> no. Well, he's not a scientist. He's an entertainer. No. He's not a scientist. In 214, Forbes, which deals with wealthy people and what happens, uh, he was estimated that 520 million this year, in 2018, him and his wife are over a billion. Um, who knows this humble student? Do you know who he is? Yeah? No, right? You know who he is, right? I had one of the young girls in my, in my previous district, and uh, I remember we were talking about this in a certain setting, and I just showed the picture, and she said, she was 15, and she said, oh, I adore him. <laughs> that was her exclamation when I put the picture on the, on the screen. You wonder who these people are, who, they, who made them this powerful? Well, there's one word, media made them that powerful. Who's this guy? Well, I don't need to speak on this because all of you probably know more than me. Who's this guy? Well, South America, Europe. They all know about him, Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo. Soccer. Uh, he's number 10 on the fourth list. He's one of the wealthiest people in the world. What is he doing? Soccer. 
of soccer. Yeah, I mean, hundreds of, I mean, tens of thousands of people watching how many guys, 16 guys, or how many, I mean, 14, running after the ball. And you wonder, as you see that uh, he's also the world's most popular athlete with 102 million Facebook and 35 million Twitter followers. 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 <coughs> um, Mr. Leonardo da DiCaprio, you know him too, right? And his movie Titanic. How many of you have seen Titanic? Yeah. Did you cry? Did you cry? <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> again, the same, the same people. You see, you see him holding in their hands the golden image, right? The golden image, the, the statue from Daniel two, right? <laughs> yes. But I mean, it's, I mean, think of, think of the analogy. Just think of the analogy that they are holding actually Oscar, which is actually an interesting, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Well, let me. You've seen this passage uh, written by this mathematician, logician, philosopher, a British uh, gentleman in his book, The Scientific Outlook, and I, I presented this a few weeks ago. I think it's so profound. The great majority of young people in almost all civilized countries, interesting, in the civilized countries. Why in the civilized countries? Because of the media, because people somewhere in the forgotten Africa or in forgotten Siberia or in other places they don't have access to media. But we, in the developed countries, we do. Derive their ideas of love, honor, of the way to make money, and of the importance of good clothes, from the evening spent in seeing what Hollywood thinks good for them. I doubt whether all the schools and churches combined have as much influence as the cinema upon the opinions of the young in regard to such intimate matters as love and marriage and money making. The producers of Hollywood are the high priests of any religion. You've seen this passage before, some of you, to me, sounds so true. And it's made by someone who's not a Christian and he doesn't have spiritual interests. But he made a very good observation. Well, <clears throat> The new gods of the age have tremendous power and millions of worshippers. They worship in public arenas, in small groups, or in the privacy of their bedrooms. The new gods are adored, dreamed of, and rightly called the idols. The, idols. the entertainment has become the idolatry for the last generation. Are we part of it? Do we bow down to the golden image? The entertainment and the spiritual life. I'll try to go fast through some of the slides. The entertainment is not new. <clears throat> it has a long, long, very long history. What you see in the image is the Colosseum in Rome. It, will, it was built in eight years after the year 70s by uh, two or three Roman emperors. The seating capacity was between 65 to 80,000 people. Almost the average was 60,000 people. The destination of this building was what? Uh, math lectures, science, right? No, sporting events. It was sporting events, entertainment. Then the major purpose of building the whole, this with the price of many slaves and many lives, was the entertainment. What you could see in those, in, in those places were live fights. What they did in the Colosseum was replicas of some of the famous battles with groups of slaves which were fought, which they fought for real. People died in real time. And they call that entertainment. But again, as you know, society has evolved and then we moved through centuries to a different lifestyle, and we ended up with the theater. And um, uh, it has the same purpose, to entertain people, and people will go to the theater. If you want to invite your girlfriend somewhere, you invite her to a theater, and people will go there to spend some of their best evenings 
some, when they could save some money, they will go to theater. It was, it's interesting the observation that uh, Sister White makes on the theater. And she says, among the most dangerous resorts for pleasure is the theater. Instead of being a school of morality and virtue, as it is often claimed, it is the very hotbed for immorality. Vicious habits, sinful propensities, are strengthened and confirmed by these entertainments. Low songs, low gestures, expressions, and attitudes deprive the imagination and debase the morals. I shouldn't say this when, 150 years ago. Every youth who habitually attends such exhibitions will be corrupted in principle. There is no influence in our land, she's speaking about the United States, more powerful to poison the imagination, to destroy religious impressions, and to block the relish for the tranquil pleasures and sober realities of life, then theatrical amusements. The love of these scenes increases with every indulgence, as the desire for intoxicating drinks strengthen, strengthens with its use. The only safe course is to shun the theater, the circus, and every other questionable place for amusement. Does this uh, statement apply today in any way? It does? Can we apply it to some of the entertainments we have today? I, I would say to many of them, to lots of them. Some of the spiritual concerns I would like to address tonight are five of them. Number one, it takes the best time. Number two, it has a hypnotic effect. Number three, it changes the moral values. Four, it corrupts the files. Five, it leads to the lost frontier, the supernatural. So we'll go through all of them. It takes the best of time. When do we, when do people spend their most time in front of the screen? When? In the evening, right? Most of the time in the evening. You come home for a long day, it's busy, tired, you want to you, to, you want to relax yourself. You, what best thing you can do then drop in your couch and flip through the channels or go to your computer, go through your Facebook or most most of the people, most of the people find their best time to interact with media in the evening, at the end of the day. Interesting enough that should be the time we should spend with who? Family. Family and God. Family first and God, ultimately. Spend this time with God. I have come to the observation the media, basically, um, by the way, the day begins when? The day begins in the evening. The day begins at sunset, according to the Bible, as we know. Actually, the next day begins, actually, in the evening of the day. And I believe that the devil has been smart enough to play with human beings and to take us the best time of the day, which is right there in the evening, which is actually the beginning of the following day. I have the opinion that the devil is able, through the media, to steal the best time we, we could have. And he's spending this, instead of spending our time with God in a personal fellowship and time, we share our time with media. Often the time they should be spending devotion is eaten up by the media. Sometimes it begins with, <clears throat> I don't know if that's your case. Sometimes it begins with, oh, let me watch the news. A little bit, you watch the news. From the news, you want to see a sport event. From the sport event, you want to watch a movie. And then by that time, it's 11 or 12. Tired, we may say a prayer. Some say a prayer and then go to bed. Others, <coughs> surfing the internet, <coughs> Facebook, you want to see what the friends have said. Watch this, see that. But by the time you end, by the time you finish, the time for devotion, there is nothing left. The Bible says about Jesus Christ, it came to pass in those days that he went out in the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus had a busy life. Fortunately, they didn't have internet. 
in those days, right? No. But even if they had internet, I believe that Jesus would leave everything behind and he would go by himself to spend his time with God. It takes, <clears throat> sorry, it takes determination and um, commitment to Christ, to God. It takes an, a, a strong power of will to, to move away, I would say, from the media, which is very tempting, and to spend the time with God. Secondly, it has a hypnotic effect. Hypnosis is defined as the induction of a state of consciousness in which a person apparently loses the power of voluntary, voluntary action and is highly responsible, responsive to suggestions uh, to suggestion or direction. It's a very interesting state where the person is alive and aware, but something happens to the mind. The mind becomes open up to outside influences. In an article where they would taught people how to relax and meditate, and how to practice a kind of a self-hypnosis, they told them, and I'll show the passage. Um, you put a candle in front of you, a candle, with a flickering light in front of you, and you look at that and basically try to focus on that until you, until you begin to lose the contact with the, with the world around you. This is what they say. What happens during this experience is as follows. Your eyes are fixed on the image of the flame and since, since they are not moving, no new information is received by the brain to process. You will feel areas of peripheral vision beginning to fade away completely. Slowly, everything else will fade away till you are not visually aware of anything but the flame. This experience is amazing. Your eyes are wide, wide open, but all you see is a small flame in front of you. You may feel as if there is no distance between you and the flame, between the flame and yourself. It may seem as if you have become one with the flame. Um, let's begin with this example. Have you seen kids watching TV? How do they behave? Have you seen them in the mesmerized? Johnny! He's not there. No. Mary doesn't respond. We have, I remember we, we for, I have, a, I have my own experience with television. And uh, we didn't have a TV in our home. We got married, didn't have a TV. <clears throat> and then we had our son, Nathan. He was two, year, two years old. And then somehow the color TV came in Romania. By, during communism, they had black and white. But after the fall of communism, we, we, being, we, we begin to be blessed by all kinds of Western blessings, many of them, wonderful of them, many of them. One of them was the color TV. And the price was, of gas was going up and down and some of the changes in the countries. And I said to myself, maybe we need to know about the current events. <laughs> and um, it did happen that my cousin would be for England and he had a color TV, and we talked to him, and I said, sure, we want it. We didn't have a TV for many, many years in our home. And I'll say later on that I was, a, I mean, I, I consider myself, I was addicted to movies. And we bought a TV. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, to make the whole story short, we have a television somewhere, and one day, my grandmother, my mother-in-law was home, I don't know what she was doing, and the TV was running. And Nathan, our son, he was just sitting on the floor and watching the screen. I mean, he was completely transposed. And he was like hypnotized. And I called him, Nathan, he was from here to there. He didn't hear me. Oh, he would get Nathan, he didn't hear me. I had to call him three times, obviously, louder and louder. Finally, he woke like, like from a trance. And, and, and we reestablished contact. And I said to my servant, to Alina, I said, we have to get rid of it. And we, we, we got rid of the television again. Um, it has a hypnotic effect, I believe, in terms that it, it absorbs 
your thinking to the degree that you, at one point you lose your contact with the outside world. Um, do you realize that when I'm in the front of the screen, I expose myself to another mind? Do I realize that I'm voluntarily, voluntarily vulnerable to someone else's influence? Then when I, <clears throat> you see, without getting into the details of the, how the brain works, we know that we have the frontal lobe of the brain which deals with decisions, processes information. But lots of times, when you put yourself in front of the screen, you lose that ability. Because you open up yourself to what happens. And the difference between watching the screen or reading a book is that when you read a book, you can stop in time. You process the information. When you're in front of the screen, you open up your brain for information and it's just poured in your mind. Very few of us stay in front of a TV with a notebook and say, well, let me think. Let's, let's apply critical thinking to what I see. <laughs> well, when I'm talking about entertainment, most of us, that doesn't happen. You just open, you open your mind, and your mind is flooded with information through eyes, through eyes and hearing. The change in moral values happens with the media. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, is the well-known passage, but we all, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The passage applies to Jesus Christ. The passage in the Bible applies to the fact that as we contemplate and as we as we meditate on God on Jesus Christ something happens to us we begin we are changed in the same likeness with Christ right but the process applies to other areas too and Ellen White makes a comment on second Corinthians she says this the mind of a man or a woman does not come down in a moment from purity and holiness to depravity and corruption and crime. It takes time to transform the human to the divine or to degradate those formed in the image of God to the brutal or the satanic. By beholding, we become changed. Now, you wonder when these people take the gun and they go to a school, or they go to a place, and they randomly shot people. Somewhere, at one point, something has happened to their mind. Somehow, at one point, their mind begins a transformation process. And you wonder, because that doesn't happen randomly. There must be an explanation for what happens with those, with those minds. And Ellen White in the Bible says, by what you watch, what you behold, that changes you, and that's what you become. Um, some of you, of the older generation, you may know these people. Not everybody knows them, because they belong to my generation. The younger generation probably don't know who they are. Let me see. Uh, do you know uh, who this guy is? Charlie Chaplin. All right. How about this one? Professor. Oh, we know the rest of them. Well, but I remember being being in the fifth grade, fifth grade in school. How old is a child who's in the fifth grade? And they were they were my they were my gods. They were my ideals. They were my dreams. I was I mean Charles Chaplin. I, I love his funny things and everything else. What he did, everything. Um, Fred Astaire. The dancer on the stage with plenty of beautiful ladies around him, right? And, and I, I wanted to, to learn how to do step dance. And uh, I actually wanted to become an actor. Uh, not that I had any, I, I didn't know how to do it. I mean, uh, because my father was in the technical field, I go into electronics. But if I had a choice, if someone could have told me that's what you need to become to do to become an actor, at that time in my, my life, I would have. Want to become an actor because why? 
because the television, because that's what I saw. And the way that I was portrayed there. What I'm saying with this, my whole idea, my, my this is a term, the, the world view, which represents your beliefs and ideals and goals, and it completely changed my mind. Then I, I want it to be just like them. God, oh, feels too far away. Church was, I have me with a word, and how was church? Uh, it begins with B. Boring. Church was boring. I mean, nothing exciting happens in church. I mean, right? I mean, they would say that the church is for old people. I mean, everybody would say that. Then I, at, at that time, the point, what's the point? The point is that media completely changed my view on life, my ideas, my goals. And uh, with a side effect, the church and God and the Bible didn't have anything interesting. It changes your values. There is a study done, and uh, <clears throat> I just got one of the, the passages from the study. It says, in this new environment, radio, television, movies, video, video games, cell phones and computer networks have assumed, they have assumed a central role in our children's daily lives. For better or for worse, the mass media are having an enormous impact on our children's values, beliefs, and behavior. But these are not Adventists. I mean, these are not Christian people that make these observations. They're just secular scientists. They look at society. They look at the behavior of the kids. They look at them and say, well, that's what, that's what happens to them. And another one, a study done on 350 youth. The age of the students was between 9 to 15. And in the study, they realized this. During a sensitive developmental phase, Teens. By the way, what happens during the teenage years? What happens, and, and I could call maybe Dr. Teske last night when he spoke on sleep, and he spoke of what happens with the brain during the growing teenage years. Basically, in your brain, you're just growing new roots. You develop new connections. New circuits in your brains are developed. Some of them some of them are new, some of, if you don't, some of them, if you don't use them, you lose them. Then the time to grow your mind, to grow your brain, is right here in the teens and teenage, teenage years. Well, what happens during this time? They are, preteens are the largest users of media, consuming over seven and a half hours a day, seven days a week outside of school. That's what they say in this study. I don't know if I will do a survey tonight to ask to be able to compare Christian versus non-Christian. How many hours, how, many, uh, how much time do you use with media? Um, but I would assume at, at one point it, it, adds up, it, it, it adds up to hours. I'm going to skip a few passages. Um, basically, the, this other study has shown that people are influenced by the media in the way they choose their values. The study says, let me see, they say participants answered about their future goals clustered around two factors. Then they asked the, these young participants, what are your dreams and goals for the future? And they divided, they, they knew about the lifestyle and behavior of the kids. And they observed that their dreams and goals were basically moving in two directions. <clears throat> One, representing individualistic, self-focused, and collectivist. This is one group. And the second group was collectivistic, other-focused aspirations. I don't like the terms, but uh, anyway, fame, image, money, and status were items in the former, <clears throat> meaning that one group had these ideas and goals, to be famous, the image, money, making, uh, the staff is becoming somebody. The other group, the second group, helping others in need, helping family, and living near family were items in the, in the later. <clears throat> Watching television and using the social networking site each predicted self-focused aspirations. Yeah. Basically, what, happened, what they observed was that people watching a lot of media, dealing with media, they become very self-centered, very selfish, materialistic, um, egocentrics, 
while those who do not, they have other kinds of aspirations, other goals, and they begin to see life in a very different way. In the known Bible passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we know about notice that in the last days, perilous times, perilous times will come, for men will be, and the first mention is lovers of self. It corrupts the files. Uh, you see this great specialist in computer science here. <laughs> uh, my wife had a, had a computer and the fan was not working. And I realized if I don't re if I don't replace the fan in a short time, the computer is going to go. And I said I'm going to I'm going to try to replace the fan. And you see me here working, and I, I was able to do that. I replaced the fan on the laptop. It's not that easy, but I was able to do it and happy. I I succeeded. I was able to put it all together back into work. <laughs> yes, but I mean the point is the computer has. I mean the human brain. There is an interesting parallel between a computer and the human mind, or the human brain. A computer has is made out of two major parts the hardware which is the physical part the physical pieces and the software the program maybe windows 7 10 which we have the operating system which usually most of, most of the computers they come with the operating system already installed but then you install your own programs a choice there are some outside interventions and we call them viruses worms or other forces other people that tries to get into your computer. That's why you use the antiviruses and you try to protect yourself. Because on this network, it's a jungle. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a paradise by any means. And then, the computer has the hardware and the software. You see the hardware, you don't see the software. So is the brain. The human brain, guess who copied who? Yeah, well. We copied God's model, model. We have a brain. I mean, I guess all of us have a brain. It's, the, it's, it's here in this box. It's, 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 it's the physical part. It, I mean, it's the size of, of my fist for most of us, right? Um, the physical aspect. But you have the software. Oops. You have the software which is installed on your brain. We come already at birth, you come at birth of a human being, comes, comes with a software. Then, uh, well, the heart beats and you don't know that. We breathe and we don't coordinate that. The eye moves, the liver, the kidney, then, and everything is in the brain. When you are born, it's there, it grows, and so on and so forth. But already human beings come with a software. And slowly in life, we begin to install medical programs and, and we acquire, you know, if the brain fills up, you know, you fill your hardware with all kinds of information and you put all kinds of programs in the brain. So far, so good. But there is, like in the computer world, there is someone outside that tries to get into your mind. The hackers, right? The hackers. But he's a bigger hacker from the beginning. The Bible calls him the old serpent, the devil. He's the greatest hacker of all. And he wants to penetrate human mind. And he uses his methods to get into my brain and into your brain. <clears throat> Matthew says, But as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son and be. What happened in the days of Noah? We read in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 6. I'm using this because we speak about the corrupting the files. When you have a computer, at one point the computer, the computer doesn't work, or it doesn't work right. And you say, well, what happened with it? Well, the files were corrupted. By what? By a virus, by a worm, by someone somehow got into your computer and corrupted your files, and it's not working, pro it's not working properly. It happens the same with human mind. The old hacker was able in the flood generation to basically get in, got, he got into the minds of people to the point that the Bible says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts 
of his heart was following evil continually. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Then somehow, during the flood generation, the devil was able <coughs> to get into the minds of people and hack their minds completely. But the computer was good for nothing. It was, was completely broken. It didn't function at all. Was 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 gone. And there was no way for God to bring those people to restore their minds back. <clears throat> Sometimes you have a problem with the computer, and one way to do it, you try to restore your computer to a previous day. Or you try to do something to to save your computer. <clears throat> Sometimes there is nothing you can do. In the flood generation, God came to the point where the human minds were so corrupted, there was nothing he could do. Please observe the, exact, the expressions corrupt and violence. Well, the word corrupt actually means immoral. <clears throat> In the flood generation, the flood generation was um, characterized by two main things, immorality and violence. That's what the Bible says. Corrupt means actually morality and filled with violence. And the thoughts of mind were continually evil. Now, you tell me, today in the media, what are the main things in the media today? Morality, morality and violence. The same old things is the same thing. <clears throat> Immorality and violence. Even in the cartoons, you remember some of us watch cartoons when we were kids, and the parents will say, Oh, no problem, he's watching cartoons. Right, he's watching cartoons, or she's watching cartoons. Cartoons, violent, right? There, there must be some fighting there with someone. Someone has to fight there to make, to make it fun, right? And some kind of a love story. I mean, there always has to, there has to be a love story. You know, when, they, when the first time they developed the television, <clears throat> what they did with the television, the first time when they did the first video clips, they will do a filming of people cutting wood. So interesting to watch someone cutting wood. Right? <laughs> <laughs> cutting wood or, or piling hay or doing something. And I mean, the business was failing. And they said, well, we have to change it. We have to do something. We have to do something to make people want this. And guess what they did? Well, they invented, they invented, you know, some movies. One of the first movies, if I remember correctly, was robbing a bank. Mm -hmm. People running a bank, robbing a bank, and, 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 and going away, and chasing, and fighting, and this. Oh, and people, people wanted to see that. Mm -hmm. Violence and immorality, the main themes, and lots of movies, lots of songs. What's, when you, what, you tell me what's a game. Most of the games are actually competitive. It's a fight. We have to defeat someone. We have to, to win. <clears throat> Susan Greenfield, <clears throat> she's a scientist in England. She's a very smart lady. She spoke a few times in front of the English Parliament. She's a brain scientist. <clears throat> and she made an interesting observation. She said, one of the most exciting concepts in neuroscience is that all experience, <clears throat> every single moment, lives its marks almost literally on, a, on your brain. It is this evolving personalization of the brain that we could view as the mind. <clears throat> you see, we speak about the brain. The brain is an organ. What is the mind? Well, we, even, we, we, still, we still research, we still want to know what is actually the mind. We know something about the way the, the, the thinking process works. Do you know that, by the way, <clears throat> I remember being young and reading some of the Ellen White writings, most of you are familiar with her writings, and I read that she speaks about electric currents in the brain. And I remember reading that. 
that she was speaking about the electric currents in the brain. I said, what? I said, <clears throat> I didn't know what to make of it. Well, believe it or not, actually it's a thinking process. It's an electronic process. We transmit information through the mediums of electric currents in the brain. You have actually uh, electricity in, in, in your cell. In, we have those electricity. Um, then it is this uh, evolving personalization of the brain that we could view as the mind. And it is this mind that could therefore be radically changed by prolonged exposure to a new and unprecedented type of ongoing environment, that of the screen. What she basically says is that the exposure to the screen changes your mind. Physiologically changes the brain, changes your mind. When it corrupts the fire, something interesting happens with human beings. One thing that happens is we lose our sensitivity to sin. You watch enough fighting, and it's, it's okay. I mean, it doesn't surprise you anymore. It has a secondary effect, lack of interest in spiritual things. And then it leads to boredom, uh, boredom and apathy. And this, at one point, it becomes physiological changes in the brain. <clears throat> the brain, <clears throat> there is another concept called brain plasticity, which says that actually brain changes all the time. It, it adapts all the time. That's why we're able to learn new things. Because the brain has the ability to change. Again, brain plasticity. Um, and it goes, it can go towards good things, it also can go towards evil and bad things. The concept, the concept of corrupting the files, I believe that the old hacker is working on our generation in corrupting the files as much as he can to prepare the flood generation in the 21st century. To come to a generation of people that have been accustomed so much with evil, so much with immorality, that it doesn't shock them anymore. It's common. It's, it's something that happens all the time. I don't know if you read the news, but I, I, I'm, I'm having a very hard time to read the, this, the news I have. Because every time, all the time, you read about crimes, killing, all kinds of bad stories. In the news. When you read them, at one point you read them to a point that, well, well someone killed someone, or the guy went to another school and he shot another 10, 15 people. Well, nothing new. In the Bible, Corinthians says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts the good habits. Again, the word corrupts. And please remember the term using the computer science corrupting the files, because actually that's what happens to human mind, to human brain. The last aspect for tonight. <clears throat> Are you familiar with these names? Yeah. Harry Potter, Potter, Lord of the Rings, Twilight. What are they? What are they? What's the novelty they're bringing into the movie industry? Spiritualism. They have passed the age of cowboys and Indians, you know, oh, that's, or detectives and this and that, oh, that's kids' stuff. They have to come up with new ideas, new things, new shocking things. They're moving into the supernatural. And they make supernatural funny. They think that playing with the devil, oh, it's just a game. I mean, it's, the devil is not so bad, actually. I remember, I don't remember exactly when was this, but I think this was a show they advertised at one point in 2016, and they said, May 16, be filled with plenty of deep, dark secrets. <laughs> the name of the show was? Lucifer. Lucifer. That was the name of the show, Lucifer. I, I am not asking if you watched it or any. <laughs> I'm not asking that question on a Friday night, Saturday, but the point is, you know, cowboys and Indians are left way behind 50 years ago. 
they're moving now to the last frontier, which is the supernatural, the interaction with the devil and death. That's okay. what's funny. I remember flying on a plane. I don't remember exactly which way where from the sun to soul. And there was, as you know, there are screens and on the long flights, you have the screens, you can watch movies and stuff. In front of me, I think there were two teenagers. And I was curious, what are they watching? Guess what, what they were watching? The horror movie. They were watching the horror movie. I mean, I just, I mean, between the seats, I was able to see what they were watching. And I was curious, what are they watching? And I said to myself, what is the effect on their mind? What is that doing to, to them? <clears throat> there was a group of young kids, I mean teenagers, camping. And they were talking in their tent, a group of five or four, or four or five boys. They were talking in the tent, and one of them said, I can't sleep at night. And the other one says, why not? I have nightmares. I can't sleep. Dark beams are coming over me. I mean, scenes of cruelty and terrible thoughts, and I can't sleep. I have nightmares. Well, what you didn't know is that the same boy was watching horror movies and playing all kinds of interesting computer games. And the effect of that is that he came to the, he reached the point where he was not able to sleep. <clears throat> you might have heard of this. A storyline a few years ago. Two 12, year, 12, 12 years old girls <clears throat> are facing attempt to, mur to murder charge for allegedly, allegedly stabbing another girl 19 times in the woods in <clears throat> Wisconsin. Police say they were trying to please an online demonic creature called Stangerman. Yes. I saw it. Yeah, I saw that special. They lured have, their friend. Yeah. They yeah. lured their friend into, exactly. the, into the, the woods to kill her. Two girls, they lure them, and they're, they're making plans that you can imagine two girls, 12 years old, making plans how to kill their friend. Yep. And they did. They killed her. They, they did. Well, fortunately, as I understand, she escaped because no. even she, she was stabbed, she was able she to... She escaped too. Anyway, that's that's less important in a sense. I mean, my story is that she survived. That's what I remember. But you think, kids, twelve years old, how did they come to that point? Well, guess what? Media, social media, lead them to that point. <clears throat> the Slender Man was created in two thousand and nine by a guy who posted images of a character as Victor Surge in a thread called "Create Paranormal Images" on the humor. Website somethingawful.com. Soon afterwards, Slenderman became a popular presence in online stories and spooky YouTube videos, turning into a walking boogeyman familiar to who? Lots of kids. Then you see people are transitioning from cowboys and Indians to the next to the next level. And you can train with death. I don't want to give ideas tonight. That's why I'm not, I mean, I'm sorry even I said this about stand man because I, I hope no, nobody goes home and Googles that and try to become a client of that, whatever. But um, I know a family. Good people, very good people, both of them professionals. I think they have two kids. I don't remember. <clears throat> One of them is probably 10, 12 years old. Somehow the parents found out, somehow, they saw that something was strange with their daughter, the oldest of them. Something was not right, you know, when you know your kids, when you spend enough time with them, they, they saw something was, let me say, I'm talking about the seven man and his family. Something was not right with the daughter. <clears throat> somehow, somehow they were able to get to talk to her and they, she somehow, explain to them what she was doing. Well, she got into one of the games, and I'm not going to say the name, which is a 50 babes. Have you heard of this? It's a, it's a kind of a social media game 
where you get into the whole thing and you receive orders from someone on the internet and you have to report every time. And you have a timeline of 50 days. Every, every day you have a task. You have to report to the guy <coughs> or to those there that you have accomplished the task. You have to take a picture of, of yourself showing that you did. You must be in the 50th day. Suicide. It's a suicide. And this, there are multiple games. If you're, I'm not going to tell you the name of one of them. But there are multiple games played on social media. Kids are getting into this. Parents have no clue. And I'm telling you a story of a seven family. They, they somehow got their daughter to, to talk. She was a, finally, she told them that she's basically, because they take you through successive steps. For example, in the first day, they tell you, cut yourself a mark on your arm with the number D325. Cut it in your flesh. Take a picture, send me the picture. The following day, do this. The following day, do this, do this, do this, and keep it. It has to be extremely secret. And they tell you, if you tell someone, we'll, get, we'll come after you. It's absolutely, I mean, terrible. Playing with death, you know, Satan is corrupting the mind, minds of people. And, and guess what? He's using the media. This wonderful blessing that God uh, allows us to have it for the preaching of the gospel and for the research and for the good knowledge, the devil has turned it into a, a terrible weapon against people in general. And I believe God's special, God's people in a, in a special way. Only two sides, or, or those who have imprinted in their minds, on their minds, forever the character of Christ or the demonic character of the devil, or, again, there are only two options, filled with the Holy Spirit or possessed by the demons. What I'm saying is that we believe that the world is evolving to a very drastic uh, choice for every human being. There is not going to be a choice in between. And we live in the grace time now, we think, we enjoy the peaceful days, abundance of lots of things. But the world is not, the world is not stagnant. The world and the history moves on and it moves on faster and faster and faster. Where eventually every human being will have an imprint on our minds, on our souls. Christ or the old heifer, right? Then uh, we have to be mindful of that and really, really think of it. It's not a game. We think it's a game. We think, oh, I mean, it's just entertainment. I, I, I had a, a relative of mine telling me, oh, we watch movies. But he said, well, it's not affecting me at all. It has no effect on me at all. Really? Then if that's the case, why do you watch them? <laughs> it doesn't have any effect. Well, why do you do it? But um, and, and anyway, the point is that in, in Ephesians, the Bible clearly says, I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And a good friend of mine, because of a story, with internet, and he was, a, he was a computer engineer. He was a computer engineer, transitioned to pastoral work, back home in my home country in Romania, and for many years, I was trying to get in touch with him via, via email. He was a closest friend of mine. We grew up together. And I was trying to get in touch with, with him with email. I was not able to get in touch with him at all. Finally, after some years, many years, I went back and met him and I said, how is it that you're a computer engineer, you don't answer my emails? And he said, I'll tell you, I don't have internet at home. <laughs> oh, well, that's new. And he says, how's that? He says, well, at one point I decided it's better for me not to have it in my home. You may understand more than I say. I think it was a radical choice. 
show me a good one. He says, I don't have internet at all. I know what I need to do if I need to go, go to the library, do this and that, but at that time, I think he got it later on, but what's my point? My point is that it's, I mean, we don't have a television at home at this point, but we have internet and plenty of computers. We have phones, all of, I mean, we have, we, we have them with us. And we, I am deeply involved in, I mean, not so much. I mean, I, I don't have a Facebook account. I, I had it one point, and I stopped having it. My wife has it. She manages our family Facebook account. And I was thinking multiple times to open a Facebook account for the ministry purpose. And I'm, I'm very much into using media for soul winning. I believe it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. So what I'm saying, like, like with everything else, it's very dangerous also. And we have to be mindful and aware of that. Because in the end, it looks innocent, you know. It looks innocent. All of us, phones, tablets, computers, it looks innocent. I believe. I strongly believe that one of the most powerful weapons used by the devil in corrupting the files, in corrupting the minds of, of human beings, is the media. And I can, uh, I am a personal witness because that was my experience. Um, and I, again, I had a hard battle with media. When I visited people and I go to visit someone, if they have a television running, I ask them, please turn off your television. When I visit, it happens to me, I go to visit people, I'm talking to the person and there is the TV in the background running. And I please turn off the television because I can't focus because if it's running, I can't. I mean, my eyes go there, but what's happening? <laughs> turn it off. <laughs> Take it away from me. In the end, spiritual concerns, it takes the best of the time, it has a hypnotic effect, it changes the moral values, it corrupts the files, and it leads to the last frontier of the supernatural. That's for tonight. Does anybody have a question? Any questions that pop in your mind through the presentations? Any questions at all? No questions? All right. This can be a good news or bad news, I don't know. But, uh, I'm going to uh, assume it's a good news. Um, oh, one last passage, which is Isaiah 33. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hands, refuses, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing the blood, hearing of bloodshed, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him, his water will be sure. This is a wonderful promise. Verse 16, it's a wonderful promise. You tell me, when is that promise going to be very, very valuable for God's people? In the last days, especially, especially in the last days when the world will come under uh, 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 the, the final events, the protection from God, that he will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of God's bread will be given to him and water. His water will be sure. It's a wonderful promise given to God to whom? To the above. Right? The promise is not for everybody. The promise is given to the above people. One of the conditions being shuts eyes, his eyes from seeing evil. If you do not have any questions, um, I'm ready to have a closing prayer. Pastor, uh, yes. just before you close, uh, kind of outline the, the, the tomorrow, tomorrow so people know what to expect for tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, we'll continue with the topic. Pastor Bohr will speak for the worship service. We invite him to speak for the worship service on the same topic. In the afternoon at 2.30, I will speak on media and the family, basically marriage and the relationship parents and children. Afterwards, Pastor David Dean from Clovis Church, he will speak um, for the second seminar. We will have breaks in between, and in the end, we'll have a panel discussion. Um, in the morning, Pastor Jensen will help me with 
getting the questions from the people, from the audience. If they have questions, you will then I those questions. You put them on a piece of paper and we'll try to answer them in the evening when we have a panel discussion. Yes? What's the, the, um, the evening topic on? Yours is going to be on family and I do not remember. Okay. I think Pastor Dean speaks on the brain and the media. Uh, that's what I remember the main topic being, but I don't know. And I'm speaking on family life and the media. He speaks again on the brain and the media, how the media affects the brain. And the panel discussion will answer questions from the audience and the written questions from the morning. And should point out that after church, there'll be a potluck. Many of you don't know about that, so bring some food if you want to eat. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be helpful. <laughs> and also, there'll be a light meal provided. Supper. Light supper. Yeah. Light supper. Okay. So just plan to stay the day tomorrow. With this being said, we uh, will end and let's uh, let's have another word of prayer in person. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father in heaven, we bring our lives to you. Many of us have been playing with media in many ways. Many of us have been hurt by it. We ask for your healing upon our souls and minds. We ask for wisdom and the strength to be faithful to you. We want to keep our eyes pure, turn to you at all times. We want to turn our eyes from evil, that your promise will be fulfilled in our lives. I pray for those who have been here tonight and for everybody else that will be spending the Sabbath with us. I pray for our families and for our children in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for coming. Have a blessed Sabbath. Thank you. Thank you.